you know, some of the things I've seen in the last three years, in the last oh God, 20 years of my life, I, I, you know, I wish I didn't, you know, I'm 32 and I wish I didn't see a lot of the things I've seen so I can be naive again. The game that I love and adore and I always will um, has given me some amazing time, but it's created so much trauma and hurt. And I don't know if I'll ever, if I'll ever feel about it the same as I did as that 12 year old kid. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is former cricketer Azim Rafiq, who blew the whistle on racism at Yorkshire County Cricket Club. Azim suffered racism and bullying at Yorkshire and in 2020 spoke out about it and took legal action. It blew open a long-running scandal in this country, and several other cricketers came forward with their experiences of discrimination too. It has unlocked a long process, which is now international. Azim Rafiq, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks, mate. You have had a bizarre two or three years, very upsetting. It's got to the point where you no longer live in England. You're just here visiting from your new home or current home in Dubai. Had it really got that bad? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, uh, I feel like over the last three years, a lot of times I'm sort of looking at the whole thing and thinking, is this really happening? You know, it feels like I'm living in a film. You know, it's the sort of things you see, you know, being shouted at constantly. The abuse online has been, you know, some of the worst I've ever experienced. Um, and then, you know, the couple of incidents that happened to us the end where I decided, you know, I had to go were, you know, my wife called me and said, there's someone watching our house. And at that point I thought, you know, I'm just really waiting for something really bad to happen. I have to take my family out of this situation for their physical and psychological safety. And, and there were actual physical confrontations, weren't there? You know, people entering your property. Yeah, well, I mean, we've had uh, we had situations. You know, we we opened a business a couple of days after this blew up in twenty one. You know, we've had people coming in, abusing. You know, physically threatening. Um, you know, throwing things. Um, and then we had a situation at my parents' house where, you know, a gentleman broad daylight walked in and out of the house on the phone. You know, walked back out and then came back defecated. Um, you know, and walked away. And you you know, to this day, police have not been able to do anything about that. So. It just left us uh, feeling very vulnerable. I was fearing for my life. It was just, you know, psychologically, I got into a space where I felt like, you know, someone was going to physically do something really bad to me. Why do you think people were so angry? I think I've, uh, you know, I've spoke about uh, an issue that, um, you know, that people don't want to talk about. Um, and it implicated a lot of people. You know, it was sad to watch people that have called friends for, you know, my existence in the UK. Uh, go on social media um, and, you know, abuse me. And, you know, there were sections of the press that the the way they behaved, especially local press, got a local a lot of local people really angry. Um, and, you know, truth hurts. You were born in Pakistan, but you became a British citizen after moving here. Do you feel British? Do you feel proud to be British? Look, Barnes has been home. You know, I... I'm proud of both of my identities. Um, at times over the last three years, I'll be honest with you, I felt like a guest, you know, um, and it does feel like, you know, you, you get it, you've had it in your life where he's, oh, he's one of us, or oh, he's one of us. And you don't realize what that means, but I haven't felt like a British person over the last three years. You know, the way I've been uh, treated from, um, you know, like I said, people that were friends, uh, the cricket community. I think there's no hiding away from the fact that cricket community sees me as a problem. Um, and, you know, that's been difficult to digest and it's been incredibly hurtful. So you, you've lost close friends over this, have you? Oh, absolutely. You know, I've, lo you know, I've lost people that uh, played an influential part in me, uh, my family being in the country, you know, the level of... So, so Asians as well? Oh, I mean, the one thing that, I'm probably not spoken about enough and uh, it's something I, I'm speaking about in the book is a lot of people uh, from my own community uh, in Yorkshire played a big part in the whole discrediting campaign. Um, that's not everyone. You know, I've had a hell of a lot of support as well. 
But, you know, it would be, it, it, it's the one thing if I was, you know, sat here sort of with what looks like an end uh, and reflecting is hurt me the most and probably will stay with me. And did that make you doubt what you were doing or worry about what you, you know, were you, were you getting it wrong maybe? No. Yeah, I, if people like you were saying you're getting this wrong. No, absolutely not. No, because I uh, at no point, I know exactly what happened, Christian. You know, I live this uh, on a daily basis. You know, I lost my son in 2018. I know exactly how I was treated and who was treating me like that. These people uh, who wanted to support Yorkshire, um, you know, I've continued to do so. They did it for their personal benefits. And, you know, this is why this space is so complex. Uh, and I've seen a lot of that. And, you know, that hurts me probably more than anything else. I mean, you mentioned the loss of your son, which, you know, itself must have been horrific and unimaginable. But that was the point at which Yorkshire got rid of you. Yeah, um, you know, it's, you know, as a human being going through something like that, you know, the, the pregnancy was really difficult. Um, and then you know, we lost our son and, you know, you're broken. Your world is broken. Uh, it's it's something I wouldn't want anyone to, you know, go through. I I literally, you know, you you make the nursery. My wife had a baby shower, uh, and you getting ready for that, and then, you know, you're carrying uh, your son from the hospital to graveyard, and you you think that people that you spend best part of a decade and a half with would be there for you. And the way I got treated around that was just I was gobsmacked. So what? Why? Did you speak about racism at that point? For a lot of my career, I didn't really realise that it was, you know, what it was that was affecting me. I'd been taking citalopram, which is an antidepressant from 2013, and not a clue why I'm taking it. You know, I was really struggling, some really dark days. And then in 2017, it sort of started to look at things and think, this is not right. And then first, initially, I reported it as bullying, um, you know, because as a person of colour, you don't want to start believing you're being treated differently because of your, uh, you know, because of your race or your religion, because then you look at everything with that lens and it becomes incredibly draining. So, I, I, you know, I think I was looking the other way for a very long time until it got to a point where no longer I could uh, attribute it to anything else but, the, uh, you know, my race. And when I lost my son and the way the inhumane, nature of how I got treated I was just like you know this can't continue and at that point you know, do you, you think they were related do you think you were treated the way you were treated because of racism you know or were you treated badly and that that prompted you to blow the whistle on racism no I think it was related because the way I looked at it is and what made me confront it properly was I'd seen lads at the club go through personal tragedies you know, um, and I've seen how they've been treated and how they've been supported uh, and, you know, above and beyond, like above and beyond. Uh, and this was a situation where, well, my thoughts are, is, you know, everything else goes out the window. And because I had reported bullying in 2017 and then later on in 2017, at, um, you know, I spoke to a board member of what myself and Adil Rashid both spoke to a board member and talked about what we felt was, you know, discrimination. Uh, but we we were hoping that things would change. Um, things just got worse. Um, and, you know, there's only so long you can look the other way before it really hits you and you've got to confront it. Seven days later, after speaking about racism, they got rid of me. Um, you know, so I lost my son and lost my career that I'd worked my whole life for um, in in a three-month period. You've given evidence in great detail about what happened, but but just give give me a flavour of what it was that you were suffering and that other people were suffering. But as a young cricketer, all you want to do is play cricket for England. And also you get... So you go in there as a 15-year-old in a big... Yorkshire squad with all these big personalities, you ain't, you know, you just got to get on with it if you want to play. And that's what, that's what I did, you know. Initially, I was very, you know, uh, sort of 
followed my religion and I stuck to that. But then you start to realize in different aspects of, you know, because one thing you do as a cricketer, you spend a lot of time together. Um, and you start, fit, you know, getting fit, made to feel different. You know, you start being isolated out of socializing. Um, I saw another player that participated in that, um, you know, get treated way differently. And then I went from being, you know, this religious, confident person to starting trying to fit in. You know, and then I was going out, socializing and doing things that I'm not proud of at all. But suddenly I was then captain of the team. I was, you know, I was getting all the opportunities. But then end of that year, you know, I had a reflection. I was like, this is not me. What do you mean? What sort of, what, what, when you say things I'm not proud of, what do you mean? You know, going out, drinking, uh, you know, I'm not proud of some of my behaviours around women. Uh, you know, the, these are things that um, I was get, going and being part of. And it was just completely against what, I, what I've been brought up as. So, uh, and, you know, I consciously or subconsciously, I felt like I had to do that to progress in my career. Um, and then when I started to sort of, you know, not do that, I've, again, I felt, I, you know, got you get removed from the whole situation. 2012, I had a brilliant season. I got picked for England Lions, a youngest ever Yorkshire captain, performed in all formats. Um, you know, last day I got, was promoted against Essex. Uh, the team went out and on the way back on that night out, you know, I was crying my eyes out to one of my teammates. And that should have been the happiest time of my career. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't work out what it was at that stage. Um, you know, and then I started getting psychological help and you know um so you didn't realize what was going on at that stage you just felt what ostracized and different you know I, is, is that because the, you know it wasn't overt racism or, or was it overt racism no it was, it was very overt racism you know as i look back now in them days when i was going out you know uh i would be in a socializing place i'd be talking to a girl and you know uh, my teammates would come over and say don't talk to him either you know he's a p-word that and that now I think back and I think, why didn't I do anything? But by the end, I was being called a P word by my teammates, people that work in, you know, in pubs. Uh, you know, uh, you've, you had a group of these young people that worked at the stadium. I was being called that and I was being ridiculed in, in public places in front of, you know, um, people, in the, you know, normal public. And, you know, I came very close to taking my own life. Why did you go back? So, you Given know, why you'd left. So I did. So this, this is a thing. This is a question I guess. I didn't leave because of uh, what I thought was racism at the time. You know, my performances in 2014, especially, started to really suffer from. Uh, you know, I wasn't uh, up to the mark in red ball cricket. White ball cricket, I was still performing, but you know, it got to a point where it felt like the right thing from a cricket point of view for everyone because I didn't know what was happening. They didn't know what was happening, but I wasn't performing and it's professional sport. So, you know, I think it was the best thing for everyone. I went away, I took a bit of a break, um, you know, I built myself back up. And then in 2016, I, um, you know, I was actually trialing at Derbyshire, uh, which was going really well. Um, and then I got the opportunity um, to uh, play a second team game with, with Yorkshire. And, you know, at that point, you know, them two years financially had been really difficult. What had you been doing to make money? You know, I literally had been doing little bits of coaching, uh, any, you know, I, just anything that people could, uh, I could do for anyone to just make a little bit. You know, I remember those times where I literally didn't leave my bed for two, three days. You know, I felt embarrassed to go to my parents. There was times where I, you know, I wouldn't go out of the house because I couldn't afford to put the petrol in. You know, I've, I'd gone days where I wouldn't leave my bed or even eat. Because I felt embarrassed to go tell, you know, I signed my first professional contract at 17. I'd been self-sufficient, you know, um, from a very young age. So, and also, you know, in an Asian family, as the eldest son, I felt a responsibility to my siblings and the rest of my family. So I found that really difficult and cricket was all I knew. Um, so I got this opportunity. I, I thought, you know, I might as well play the second team game while I'm waiting for Derbyshire uh, to be able to get the resources. And at that time, the one day captain of Yorkshire was a friend, Alex Lees, um, who was the only person who in the end came to my son's funeral. And he was someone I, you know, I trusted. Uh, and Jason Gillespie was someone I respected. Within one game, they offered me a chance 
to, you know, because Adil Rashid was with England, there was an opportunity and I thought, you know, I've, I've been waiting sort of three or four months. I've got a real opportunity here for my cricket. I'd be silly to turn it down. And Yorkshire's a massive club. And also my club. You know, I've played for Yorkshire since the age of 11. It's, it is my club. Uh, and it was an opportunity I couldn't turn down. You know, but it's, at that stage, if I had left because of race, what I, you know, what I know now, if I had an understanding of that in 2014, 15, I would have never gone there. But I didn't. And But when I did, um, you know, I spoke up. You know, do, do you, when you look back at it, were you just being treated like every other Brown player? Or, or were you being treated differently, do you think? No, I, I would say um, I was being treated like most of the Brown players. It's for other people to speak about how they've been treated, but I read everything, I see everything, and I've seen the level of abuse towards people of colour. And do you think this is a particular problem with Yorkshire? Or is this a problem with English cricket? Oh, I'd be naive to think that this is a Yorkshire only problem. Over the last three years, I've been contacted from up and down the country. This is a cricket wide problem. This is an English cricket problem. You know, the ICC report, which was supposed to come out October, which my understanding is imminent, um, you know, I've spoken to over 4,000 people. Um, again, you know, my understanding is it's going to be, it's going to show the true picture. I'm not sure that the game is ready to accept it either. And do you think that might also be because the people at the top of cricket? are not a diverse bunch. This is an interesting, you know, really interesting part of this conversation. Representation is really important. Absolutely. It, it, you know, because especially for kids to see that, you know, uh, people that look like them uh, to be able to strive to that. But, you know, this will take it in, outside of cricket and we we'll take it a little bit politically. This is arguably the most diverse, um, you know, government representation wise that I've seen and I feel like the most damage done to people of color uh, is happening right now and has happened over the last few years so is representation the only thing that solves this issue no it's one aspect of it um, my biggest thing is I feel the way some of these solutions are looked at is right we've had this problem with South Asians we must go and get a South Asian on the board you know, they send their recruiters out, and I know this has happened. The recruiters will go out, go on LinkedIn, message anyone of colour, apply, 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 right, sorted, box ticked. So instead of actually, you know, listening to people that have suffered, listening to people as to why they feel what they feel, you know, actually, you know, understanding their experiences, listening to them, valid validating their experiences and not making them feel like, you know, or they were exaggerating it or feeling it, but it didn't happen. They've thought, right, we need to solve it. We'll run to the quickest PR. You've got, uh, you know, some anti-racism organizations. You've got some, uh, you know, community and faith organizations. And they end up becoming layers of protection for the institution. Well, how can we be racist? We work with X, Y, Z. We can't be racist. Going back to sort of how are they wanting to solve it? I don't think they know how to solve it. And they're so petrified of the words institutional racism or racist or racism that they end up, and then what they do is they surround themselves with people that will say, oh, you're brilliant. Yes, 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 that's great. As long as their fundings are looked after, as long as their sort of nest has been feathered nicely, but they don't want to go and speak to the real people. So if they put you in charge, what would you do? My solutions are very simple, right? There's one thing is not going to solve everything. There's a lot of little things that you've got to do. You've got to build trust. There's no trust. Secondly, I think you go into the recruitment element of it. Now, you cannot continue to send out through recruiters uh, messages to anyone of color and think that that's going to solve your problem. Diversity is different to representation. Um, the education is huge. So education <laughs> element, um, the... Recru sort of recruitment element and the accountability and actually realizing what does what does change look like how does that feel to be defined now as the guy who blew the whistle on racism i'm incredibly proud of what i've done you know it's it's not just what i've suffered i've seen 
what people around me have suffered. You know, people that have supported me have had to get cameras installed, fences put up, you know, um, personal relationships have broken down, professional relationships have broken down, work has drained out. So I'm incredibly proud of, you know, what I feel like I've been able to do with the support that I've had. And I'll always be proud of that, but I'm 32. Um, you know, and I know people will always talk about me in that sense, but I've got a lot more to give. You know, I was, I, I haven't spoken about cricket that much, but the opportunity here, like I was the youngest ever Yorkshire captain. You know, I captain in England on a 19 team, uh, full of, uh, you know, full of big, you know, big people that I've gone on to. So I've got a lot to give from a cricket point of view. You know, a passion of mine is uh, around talking around the game, talking about cricket, with broadcasting uh, uh, type stuff. But also, I've got a hell of a lot to achieve in my life. And, you know, in although now I'll be defined as very much sort of, you know, a person who spoke out on racism uh, and stuff, I hope in four or five years' time people can look at it. Actually, he talked about it. He went through a hard time or whatever it was, but he then used that platform to impact other people's lives in a positive manner while going on and being very successful himself. What, what you've also discovered when you do something like this, and you become very high profile, is that your mistakes come back to haunt you. And, you know, you've, you've mentioned already today, you know, your, your regrets about some of your behaviour around women. And, there, you know, there are a couple of things that have been brought to light or alleged um, which thing we should just talk about, you know, because some some of them you've apologised for, some of them you've denied. So, you know, what what's the, what's the truth about? I mean, what, what's the truth about these things, basically? I mean, when you say you regret some of your behaviour, the allegations that were made against you were that you 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 basically flashed um, a couple of people over different periods of time, and also a, a girl who you texted after having met her on a plane. You know. What's the truth about all this? I got, uh, I got messages, people trying to blackmail me for um, things I've supposedly done. Um, I had all raft of stuff thrown at me. Um, the stories are uh, around women that, um, I'll talk about the two flashing ones first. That, that story was, there was attempts to print that around December 21. And from December 21 to, I think, somewhere in the middle of the summer when they were printed, that, them stories, there was so many attempts to print that and the details of them stories constantly changed. There was attempts to try and just get enough of a something or corroboration in some manner uh, to be able to get it through. I wish I had the resources to be able to take some of these things further. But did something happen? Because you were talked to by the club about one of the incidents. I wasn't talked no. to by the club. I was never spoken to by the club about... Uh, so when, you know, that, that was the, the claim in the yeah, newspaper. The claim, yeah. the claim by the um, ex-medical guy that there was a report and he spoke to me, that's just categorically not true. It just did not happen. And even within that, from, like I said, from when, it, when they tried to print it to when it, uh, they actually printed it, they was like, oh, well, I told him. He first denied it. Then two months later, when he wasn't happy with what was happening at Yorkshire, he now said, oh, yeah, he did speak to me. By the time it printed, there was a report. I've never seen this report. No one's ever spoken to me about, uh, you know. So, so categorically, there is no truth in any of these allegations? Is the, that the, the, so so the, that, that first one, that's exactly how it played out. There is, uh, there's a second one at Northampton, which that allegation has been made out to be a lot worse than what actually happened. So I answered my room uh, in a towel. That's that's what happened. And that's been sort of manipulated into that first one. That first one is what they wanted printed. And they tried so many times. Initially, I was in the dressing room. Then I was in a bar. Uh, and then by the end, I don't even know what the, uh, where I was that it happened. Because in the dressing room, they would have needed corroboration from players. And there was other players there. And obviously, people that would have backed me up that it just did not happen. So, you know, there was... But there were so many of these things that were constantly being thrown at us. We were being hounded, like... Honestly, seven seven days a week about things. You know, I got once I got an email, not an email. I got a DM on Twitter from a gentleman that I played cricket against when I was sixteen, seventeen, and he said, "I just need to let you know this game you played against us." And this came out later. 
Um, the guy is saying that you called him, uh, you made a homophobic slur against him, um, and I was there. It didn't happen. Uh, you know, I was batting with him. It didn't happen, and I don't know why he's doing it, and I've said that to him. You know, so luckily for me, I found out before it actually got put to us that this was being planned, right? That gentleman had been DMing me, tweeting me, basically saying that that I need to ring him, get in touch with him. And I was like, I've not done this, you know? So you had all of these situations taking place. You know, once I got um, DM like late at night, you know, you met my now wife when um, when you were 16, when you were both young, get in touch with me. Um, in the next 24 hours or I'm going to the press. I'm like, crack on, you know? So I had a hell of a lot to that to deal with. I tried to deal with most of it with, you know, with I wanted to deal with it with integrity. I didn't want to get involved in some of the stuff, but, you know, some sections of the press, it's safe to say if I had the resources, uh, you know, I would, I would look to take it a lot, lot further. But well, what about the text messages? Just to be clear, so people know what we're talking about, there was an, there was an, uh, there was a, young woman who came forward and alleged that you had met her on a plane and then had texted her in a suggestive way um, and that she was 16 but she'd said she was 17 um, and that this was creepy. We were sent this little screenshot of, you know, of a conversation that clearly was uh, leading into uh, that part and we were just sent that and nothing else. Uh, and so I thought, I'll get home, I'll have a look at it and then, you know what, get in touch. Uh, and if I think there's something here that I need to apologize for, we'll apologize. Wednesday, I got home. Thursday, Thursday sort of late at, um, 12 o'clock, the anti-Semitic uh, messages came out. So we had to deal with that. So I, you know, we dealt with that and I wanted to deal with that from but, day one. But had you, you know, do you regret your behavior? Had Not, you behaved badly? This is what I'm going into now. So I was told, she, she said she was 17. I, uh, we had conversations that led up to that. Um, looking back, I wish I hadn't sent her messages that I did. Um, she said no, and I d we didn't speak again. So I don't, uh, there's, there's, I regret sending them specific messages, you know, and you know, the one thing if I, I wouldn't now, uh, but in the, gr in the way it was described and the way it was sensationalized, I don't agree with that. You know, and I, I'm not going to be a person that's just going to sit there and just apologize for everything. Uh, be, you know, where I think I'm wrong, I'm, I'm well, you know, I was strong enough to stand up and say I'm wrong. The first thing I said when I first spoke out is I'm not proud of, I'm not perfect. Perfection isn't a human trait. And I'm not proud of some of my behaviors when I was younger. I mean, in passing there, you mentioned the anti-Semitism uh, posts from social media. So let's just talk about that briefly. Um, Again, that these were old posts from when you were a young young man. Um, what, what did they say? And so we were. There was a th group, three of us, um, and I think. Well, I I can't remember the exact thing I said, but I tried to infer that one of the guys wouldn't pay for um, dinner uh, because uh, and called him a Jew. Now I, you know, as I said when I first spoke out, I thought. You know, I'd be attacked for a lot of things. That was one thing I never had, a, you know, never expected. But when it happened on that two, Thursday afternoon, my PR guy got in touch with me um, and he was livid. You know, a lot of my team were absolutely, you know, a lot of people put their neck on the line, supported me pro bono. He was livid with you? I was fuming. You know, a lot of the people that supported me and were around me were fuming. And I very calmly, I said, look, I'm sorry. It's definitely me. Um, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to, uh, you know, there's going to make sure there's no excuses. Uh, you know, I hope I've been able to demonstrate that how sorry and I'm, you know. I mean, you know, do you, do you accept that that was a racism within yourself? Whatever the reason was that I said that, um, I, so I went on a, you know, I went and met, um, I, I went to the Jewish uh, Museum and met, um, a, you know, I met a Holocaust survivor and a kinder transport uh, survivor. And that was the first time, uh, and the gentleman at Campaign Against Anti-Semitism explained to me the actual, um, the actual, you know, the connotation behind what I said. So, and actually the community that I belong to, we have a similar connotation talked about ourselves, but I didn't know 
what I was saying, what it meant, clearly because I didn't know there was a connotation. But clearly, whatever the reason was, that was anti-Semitic and racist. Yeah. Around the time I was with England in the 19s, and this was brought into our dress, this term calling everyone a Jew was brought into our dress room by a, a player. And, you know, it was, you know, it was very casually used by a lot of people. But that's no excuse for me. Actually, if you accept and apologize instead of going around it and doing everything else, you get, a, there's a real sort of strength in moving forward. But did that give you an understanding of why people were using the P word? That's one of the things I've said is like, By actually, the way, do you, do, you, do, you, do you agree with calling it the P word or do you just use the word? I normally use the word, but yeah. I wasn't sure about um, the actual, obviously, the podcast and yeah. stuff. But, you know, I, I prefer calling Paki because, you know. Because that's what you heard. Th well, that's what I heard, and it makes people uncomfortable. I've often had this conversation. It makes actually. people it makes um, people uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, you know what? Because uh, if you it should make word, you if It should make you feel uncomfortable. So if, if racial slurs have been normalised, um, when you talk about accountability, is it right to punish people? You know, is it is it necessarily a young player's fault if he repeats a racial slur that he's been hearing for years casually bandied around? It should never have been about individuals. It should never have been about individuals. It has to be about the institution. It's the leadership that needs to be held accountable. But you know, when you think back to being a, being a young boy who had dreams of cricket, you know, what, what do you remember about those dreams? And what do you think about that young boy? You know, I, I grew up in Pakistan, the first sort of 10 years of my life. Cricket, from the day I was born, you know, I played on the streets. Um, you know, from my mum will be running around trying to get me to come up and, you know, read the Quran and do my homework and cricket was everything. We moved to this country, uh, you know, I was actually, what are we, first of May today? And just walking, around you get that you know the start of summer feeling um you know get used to get picked up to go play under 12s under 13s under 15 matches um you know you i remember my coach that used to pick me up you know listening to talk sport on the radio um you know cricket is something i've loved and adored all my life it hurts me where i've got with the game in terms of you know uh, but the one thing I'm very, I committed to myself when I spoke out is that I'd never put myself in an environment that doesn't value me. Um, but yeah, it, it, it hurts uh, how I feel about it, about the game, you know, just like I said, just walking around and sort of the early summer feelings. And I was thinking yesterday, God, what I, what, what I would love to go back to that 12 year old, naive to the world. You know, some of the things I've seen in the last three years and the last, you know, last sort of, um, God, 20 years of my life, I, I, you know, I wish I didn't, you know, I'm 32 and I wish I didn't see a lot of the things I've seen uh, so I can be naive again. The game that I love and adore and I always will um, has given me some amazing time but it's created so much trauma and hurt and I don't know if I'll ever, if I'll ever feel about it the same as I did as that 12 year old kid. What, what would you say to the, your 12 year old self? Be true to yourself. Um, you know, that if there was one thing I regret is, is trying to fit in for a dream. My dream was to play for England. My dream was to be the best in the world. And for that dream, I was, you know, and I guess that comes from a little bit from the sort of mindset of a professional sports person. You sacrifice everything. You know, I used to get out and run and run and run, you know, missed countless Eids, countless birthdays, family events, because all I wanted to do is play cricket for England and be the best in the world. Um, you know, but within that obsession of being, uh, I compromised for a period of time of my life, my own values, enjoy the game, play with a smile on your face, uh, but remember that you as a human being and what you stand for um, and being able to look yourself in the mirror will be a lot more um, stronger than, you know, a dream of being successful in the game. And if you could make wave a magic wand and change the world in some way? How would you change it? I, I, I feel incredibly 
worried for our society in the UK right now. I really do. I think it's the most divided. I think some of the politicians and the way that they've behaved in the last few years and continue to with some of the language that is used um, is is dividing us and creating hate. And, you know, them words have actions on our streets and in our institutions and in our workplaces. Uh, I would love the leaders of this country, I would love the politicians to, you know, have some courage about them. Yeah, I would love them to ha have some transparency and, you know, um, be open about um, some of the things that we're facing because, you know, what I've learned over the last three years and seen is I don't like this and it's used and it's brushed off as, as diplomacy. You know what? I'd love people to just be them and be honest and everyone to respect each other for that. Um, and I think that comes from the top and unfortunately it isn't doing at the minute. Azim Rafiq, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.